And what follows is the best scene in the movie. Eric Hovind running around in the dark, getting repeatedly startled by different things. <laughs> Hello lovely people, my name is Emma. Welcome back to my channel, welcome if you are new. I'm a little bit excited about today. I won't lie, I had a lot of fun doing this. Yes, that's right, today we are going to recap and review the creationist short film Night at the Creation Museum. Although at the time I watched it live, it was called Night at the Creation Museum V2. They later removed that and re-uploaded it. Shh. Downer. This short parody... Is it a parody? It kind of looks like atheist satire, but it's definitely not that. It's made by and starring key members of the Answers in Genesis team and their friends, including Eric Hovind, Tim Chaffee, and Dr. Danny Faulkner. Faulkner is actually a real doctor of astronomy, if you were wondering, for once a creationist gets their legitimate doctor title from me. The short was recorded at the Creation Museum, owned, of course, by Answers in Genesis. And to be fair to Eric and the team, he explains before they start that it was recorded on his phone, it was just a short, fun project to give to their audience, so we're not going to critique the filmmaking too much, maybe once or twice because I can't help myself. I will say I was surprised at how it looked when I watched it. If it really was all filmed on Eric's phone, then they at least must have had a gimbal or something because it's very stable and smooth. There was some marginally higher end equipment in there, definitely. It's also probably the first time I've seen a shot on mobile for fun project that had a production manager, a coordinator, and an assistant. For a silly short film, it actually looks kind of good. It's well lit. There aren't a ton of continuity errors. The framing is pretty successful. It's the content that sucks. Roll it. We open with some very stylish drone shots and a time lapse of the museum. The titles are fun, although the tracking's a little bit shaky. Nothing I would really condemn for a small project like this. It really reminds me a lot of the digital title sequences I made at uni. The titles are projected into the real museum on exhibits and in doorways. It's a lot of fun, but it also showcases a lot of familiar names. Both Eric Hoven's mother and brother seem to have been involved, as well as more Answers in Genesis staff. There's a shot of a room in here that baffled me slightly. There's a series of books laid out on a table, including Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, A Vision of the Human Future in Space, Darwin's On the Origin of Species, Dawkins' The God Delusion, The Bible, but also Toy Brick Towers and A Fruit Bowl? <laughs> what is this room? Finally we get into the film proper, and what's the first shot? Eric Hovind zooping down the road in his expensive, very clean and shiny sports car that even has Go Faster stripes. It pulls into the parking lot and out pops Eric, or rather his character Derek, the Creation Museum's new night guard. You're telling me a museum night guard is driving this car? I am clearly in the wrong business. Derek waddles into the museum and delights us with an expository phone call, which I will deem acceptable given the length of the film. He apologises to the mysterious Sarah for rushing off, but he's got a new job to get to. And he doesn't really know what it is. It's some kind of, I don't know, museum or something. You think? It's not clear whether Derek is an atheist, but he definitely doesn't start as a young Earth creationist. And let me just say, he would never get a job with answers in Genesis without already agreeing to their doctrine. There is no way this would happen. Suddenly, Tim Chaffee materialises. He does this a lot. This is Jim, Derek's new boss. Get it? Eric and Tim? Derek and Jim? <laughs> Jim chides Derek for being late and then immediately reveals that it was oh, just a prank, bro. <laughs> He's a real card. How many fake laughs are appropriate in one video? <laughs> also, I need to know what's going on with Eric's hair here. We thought at first he was wearing some kind of hairband, but it turns out that's just the shape of his hair and I do not understand it. The mad banter continues for way too long and squeezes in a little self-flattery about Eric apparently looking like Captain America. Mm-hmm. And we get the first of many nods to the actually good film, Night at the Museum, when Jim compares Derek to Ben Stiller. All the conversations between Jim and Derek are so awkward, but I put this down to the editing and the fact that they're not actors. I think they actually do a pretty good job considering. I'm not sure, by the way, if this was filmed during Lunar New Year, or if this stuff is always here because the opening area is about dragons. If you've been, let me know. 
On his way in, Derek overshares a lot of personal information with the employer that he just met, about how he moved to be closer to his son Ricky after separating from his wife Sarah. Since this information is utterly superfluous and overly intimate, we can safely assume that this will be important later. Jim outlines to Derek that his job is to walk the halls, follow the list of nightly tasks, and most importantly, an ominous warning not to fall asleep. Jim gives Derek a museum map and his key and leaves him to his own devices. Derek sets about acquainting himself with the front desk in a fun little scene in which he messes around, plays with the equipment, and also picks up the phone to the speaker system and insults his new boss. Derek, he just left and this is a speaker system. He can probably still hear you. Did you guys meet Gigantor? <laughs> Derek grabs his list and sets off into the museum. Without his torch, by the way, the one thing he actually brought with him. No way! There's a 4D experience here? I wish this place wasn't run by Answers in Genesis. I would really love to visit. Derek casually saunters by the Evolution is Racist placard and heads into the main exhibit hall. There's a strange moment here where Derek remembers the monkey from Night at the Museum, Dexter. Except that Dexter in that movie was a little capuchin monkey. And this is supposed to be Lucy, the first Australopithecus afarensis, which at the time was the earliest human ancestor discovered. So he's mixing up ancient ape with small monkey, and I think Derek might be an idiot. Derek continues walking around, half-heartedly checking doors and being shocked at the nudity of Adam and Eve several times. And oh shit, he has his torch now. Is that a continuity mistake, or was he hiding it in his pants? We'll never know. Derek stops to chuckle derisively at the evolution versus biblical creation timeline, which is fair, because it's one of the more preposterous comparisons I've ever seen. And it should really look like this. Back at the desk, Derek resumes playtime. And then we have the most egregious moment in this little film which contains so many fun movie references, where he misquotes Darth Vader's iconic line from The Empire Strikes Back. Luke, I am your father. <laughs> Is it unreasonable for me to be mad about this? Probably, but I am. Despite his earlier incredulity, and Jim's warning about not falling asleep at any costs, and despite the fact that apparently he's been a night guard for years, Derek immediately gets bored and goes to sleep. Oh no! The one thing you weren't supposed to do! We're gifted a series of up-the-nose shots of Eric pretending to be asleep here, and I for one am grateful for such gifable material. Derek is apparently awoken by a sudden noise and rushes to investigate looking very confused and afraid, despite this being literally the point of his job. I know I said I wouldn't critique the filming too much, but this is literally the worst cut of the movie, so just let me have this one moment. We have this wide shot of the museum with Derek walking, and it cuts during his movement to him completely static, not doing anything. It's very jarring, and the editor could have made it a lot less so by just cutting the head of that second shot. I'll do it right now. Okay, moving on. They make reparations in the next shot by featuring a creeping dinosaur shadow tailing Derek, and what follows is the best scene in the movie. Eric Hovind running around in the dark, getting repeatedly startled by different things. <coughs> Derek gets waylaid through some kind of back area and ends up in the Earth is garbage because sin exhibit. So I guess he didn't check this area on his rounds? Tim, sorry, Jim materializes from the ether, as is his want and tells Derek that he's sleeping. Then we get to the emotional crutch of the film, the traumatic past that every non-believer has in cheesy Christian movies. Because nobody ever reaches atheism through rational means, Derek reveals that his mother passed away through cancer, and the question of suffering comes up. He wants to know how God created the earth when suffering has existed for millions of years. Dream Jim teleports Derek back to the Lucy exhibit, and here our education begins. Jim explains that Lucy couldn't possibly be a human ancestor because the feet are too ape-like. It's actually the valgus knee in Lucy that's an indication that she walked upright like modern humans. The greater trochanter is also short and more human-like. Her pubic arch is similar to human females. But it's much easier to ignore all of those things and be like, ape feet. Jim takes Derek to see what evolution leads to, and we're treated again to the evolution is racist trope. Cause no Christian person has ever been racist. It's kind of a pathetic straw man to feature in a museum, honestly. He teleports Derek again, this time into space. 
and we are treated to another amazing scream. <coughs> the ghost in the dark is Dr. Danny Faulkner, and he has the answers that Derek is looking for. This bit's so joyfully silly. Derek thinks for some reason that he's in space. Danny appears floating in the dark, lit by a flashlight, and then he helps Derek climb back down to the floor. Faulkner, playing himself by the way, he's the only character that doesn't get a joke name. He could have been Annie, but no. Faulkner is here to explain to Derek how starlight from millions of light years away can reach us if the universe is only thousands of years old. I couldn't wait to hear this. Finally, a real explanation from an astronomer. Maybe God performed a miracle during the creation week to rapidly bring the light here. Well, I'm sold. Derek is actually becoming convinced by one of the worst arguments I've ever heard. Faulkner explains that it takes a big god, a powerful god, to create the universe, which implies the existence of lesser gods. What is the power scale of gods, Faulkner? He waves away the issue of light travel time by saying that if you believe God created the universe, that problem is small potatoes in comparison. And then Derek goes, I guess you got a point there. What? <laughs> Apparently, God probably did a miracle, and if you believe in a powerful God, it's small potatoes, was enough for Derek to become convinced. After that enlightening talk, we get a very unnecessary shot of Faulkner's gnarly feet. Why, God, why? And then Derek has a slapping competition with a teddy bear. The best thing about this is that while the bear actually hits Eric, Eric only fake slaps the bear. <laughs> Derek runs away into dinosaur territory, where we get a delightful Jurassic Park homage. You know this section is the whole reason the film was made. A terrifying man in a dinosaur costume appears and chases Derek through the halls. The costume is amazing, where can I get one? I want one. Once again, Derek gets freaked out running into things in the dark, except this time it's dinosaur exhibits. <laughs> Luckily, Dream Jim materialises again to teleport Derek to safety, so that he can explain that dinosaurs lived with man and that fossils can be explained by, you guessed it, the Great Flood. It really helps this movie's agenda that the main character is really scientifically ignorant. Try and look menacing. Yeah? He needs a little spotlight on him. You need a little spotlight on you. Next, they teleport to the Biblical Archaeology section to chat about David and Goliath, which provides Derek another opportunity to mock Jim's height. It's a good job he's not sensitive about it. In this part of the museum, there's a piece of ancient pot that contains names similar to Goliath. So... That proves that. Derek immediately flips to... So, so all those stories are true! This guy is ridiculously easy to convince. Jim teleports Derek one last time back to the front desk where he sees himself asleep in his chair. In a sudden dramatic turn of events, Jim reveals that Derek can't wake up until he decides to take this creation stuff seriously. As if the threat of never waking up isn't enough, Jim throws in some emotional manipulation about Derek's son and his dead mother. Blackmail. It's the godly way. Derek agrees, of course, to think about it, and wakes up very overdramatically. The real Jim materialises once more to take Derek to the gift shop for a quick advert for the Genesis movie and his own book. Jim then offers Derek a very last minute gig at the Ark Encounter tonight, and I really hope that's not a teaser for another film. Honestly, one was enough. Derek then leaves the museum to go pick up his son, which I do not understand. <laughs> if he's having his son during the day, surely he'd be asleep the whole time, and he can't be having him overnight because he just agreed to work at the Ark Encounter. Anyway, that stuff doesn't matter because he's got Ricky. A book and a DVD. That's a Blu-ray actually, Derek. As a perfect mirror to the opening, the film closes with Derek revving his engine and speeding away in his flash car. And that is Night of the Creation Museum. Overall, two stars? It would have been higher if not for all the scientific misinformation. Yeah, there are a couple of dodgy cuts, but I assume the Hovind who's editing this is not a professional editor. Same with the titles and everything. I think what they did in a lot of places was very fun. A lot of it does feel genuinely like it was made by a movie lover, which is part of why the Star Wars misquote really annoyed me. A lot of the more cinematic shots really works for me as an advert for the museum. Obviously, I don't want people who could be suckered in by that stuff to go to the museum, but from their perspective of wanting to draw people in, 
I think it's actually quite effective. Watching it with the perspective of somebody who knows the information they're sharing to be false, it's quite easy to poke holes in their arguments and kind of exemplifies a lot of the ways in which they twist and manipulate the truth, which in a way makes it quite a useful tool for describing answers in Genesis and their beliefs. I had to watch it a lot to make this, and I uh, I wouldn't recommend. Honestly, I've shown you the best bits here. There are a couple of moments that made us laugh. Some of the moments made us laugh unintentionally because of how bad the science was. Some of it just made me really frustrated. And Matt and I, when we were watching it live, were sat there Googling things, being like, I'm pretty sure this isn't accurate. The fact that they have Lucy as an exhibit and just completely misrepresent what that find actually means and the ways in which she is clearly a human ancestor. It's just the fact that that's just left out and they focus on something else. Ah, oh, isn't that just young earth creationism? Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this video. Do let me know what you thought. Leave your reviews and your comments down below. I'd love to hear them. Do please consider giving this video a like. Consider sharing it. Maybe check out some of my other stuff. It all really, really helps. And before we go, I would like to give a huge shout out and a big thank you to my giant chickens over on Patreon. Aaron Spear, Amalgam of Neuroses, Amber, Burt Whitehead, Chantel, Chris Simpson, Connie Wright, Conla, Chicken Maximus Lions, God damn it, Conla, Corey Garner, Curious Capybara, Danny, Denny5252, Dr. Mint, L, Faye Gregory, Fulcrum, Gaming Ridge, Gay of Reckoning, George Bush, Henry Curtis, Izzy, Jason Metcalf, Joe Rowe, John Fry, John Smith, Kent Woodward, Chris Convaga, Lizzie Gale, Lynn Dobbs, Mattis McChicken Nuggetus, Miles Tegg, Mogaringa, Mr. Creosote, Nerd Fiction, Ninja Red, Peter Kirok, Psyched Dude, Kike, Rosina Keller, Sarah Shavi, Simping on Emma Thorne, Seriously, Tank Low, The Enchanter formerly known as Tim, The Myth Vision Podcast, Tracy O'Raw, and Wasatch Witch. <gasps> You guys are amazing, thank you so much for all your support. Before we go, I'd like to give one final thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. One of the new things I've been able to do, thanks to all that support, is pay for human-generated captions for my videos. So hopefully, if you are hard of hearing or you just prefer having captions on, you'll see that we have just so much better captions than the YouTube auto-generated ones. So you have Patreon and everybody who views and shares stuff to thank for that, so thank you. It's one of the things that I think is making my videos so much better, so I'm really pleased with that. Thank you again for watching, I hope you have a very lovely week, and I will see you really soon.